Welcome everybody. Um, today, this talk will be about bees from museum drawers to your neighborhood. And we have Christy Bills and Amanda Barth here with us. I'm gonna let Amanda introduce herself first. She's from the Utah State University and Utah Department of Natural Resources. Thanks, Amanda. Hi, thanks so much, Sophie. Um, my name is Amanda Barth. I am with the Department of Natural Resources and a partnership with Utah State University. And my role is as the Rare Insect Conservation Coordinator for the state of Utah. And what I focus on are insects that are in potential uh, decline or sensitive uh, situations, and especially pollinators. So of course that means bees. And I'm really excited to be part of Bee Fest because you know bees are extremely diverse in this state. And we actually are number one in bee diversity in the whole continent. We have over at least a thousand bees in Utah. And that's something I think is really, really special. So Bee Fest is like the best thing that we could uh, be celebrating. Um, and so I'm excited to be part of this. Thanks, Amanda. Hi, Christy. Hi. So uh, my name is Christy Bills. I manage the insect collection at the Natural History Museum of Utah um, in Research Park associated with the University of Utah. And uh, I help with, uh, so I manage the collections that are in museum drawers, but I also do uh, some outreach efforts and I help with exhibit design and education. And uh, um, here at the Natural History Museum, we also like to promote community science efforts and get people involved in uh, public participation in science, which is what community science is. So um, we do some uh, arthropod surveys in urban areas uh, to kind of understand what bees are out there and we also find just ways for community involvement so i'm involved in those kind of efforts and uh, i'm excited to talk about what we hold at the museum and why we hold it and uh, like ways that people can be involved in in the work that we do awesome so should we get started let's get started i'm right, excited started okay Okay, it's gonna happen. <laughs> Yay. Da, 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 da. Okay, can Great. you see it? Yeah. Okay, so as I said, I'm here, I'm uh, with the Natural History Museum. Um, and as a side note, we're open with reservations so people can come visit us. It's a very safe place to visit. Um, and I manage the insect collection. And uh, one of the ways that we uh, want to share the collection with people is that we database all of, we're in the process of databasing all of the insects that we hold. Um, they were collected in the last, some of them as long ago as the 1890s. Um, and they um, are held in a temperature controlled room, a humidity controlled room with 24 hour security. We keep them very, very safe. They're what we call the heart of the museum uh, because these research specimens hold uh, irreplaceable data for research. Uh, they contain information that uh, we can continue to extract scientifically in ways that when they were first collected, we didn't even fathom. So in the 1890s, we didn't even know about DNA. And so we have to think that the specimens we collect today, we don't even know what information we'll be able to extract in 100 years. Mm -hmm. So we treat these very delicate treasures um, with as much care, best practices as we possibly can, and we hold them in trust for science, but also for all the people of the state of Utah. We hold them in trust uh, so that people can understand uh, the ecology of where we are right now, so that they can understand um, the world that as it was before. Each specimen is like a little book of knowledge, um, and uh, new invasive species that might not supposed to be here, the way the world is changing. So uh, museum specimens have um, a lot of valuable information. A bug might have pollen grains that tell us about plants. They might tell us about pollution at a given time. Um, so we take our specimens very seriously. And though we keep them locked very safely, we want to find a way to share them. And that's what databases are for. So we have databased um, many tens of thousands of specimens of insects here at the museum. 
and uh, we put them online. And all of that data is accessible to the public um, in a database called SCAN, which I wanna share with people. I know databases don't seem like an exciting topic, but they really, really are. <laughs> so let's say you live in Richfield and you'd like to know what butterflies fly in May. Um, dozens and dozens of insect collections around the country have put their information in this database and it's publicly searchable. And you can say, I live in this county and I'd like to know what butterflies have been collected in the last hundred years in May in my county. And you can find out or in this particular canyon, or what kinds of uh, grasshoppers I might expect to see. And so it's a good tool for um, people who are just interested in the natural world, or maybe educators, or um, people who are really interested in land management. So uh, this is where we put our data so that we can uh, be as transparent with the public about what we hold. Um, and it takes a phenomenal amount of effort. Mm -hmm. And we are not able to image every specimen, but we're able to image a lot of them. So I uh, wanted to share some bees with you today. We take very up close pictures so that when researchers in other parts of the world, um, whereas in the past they might have to ask for a loan of a specimen, which they still do sometimes, but sometimes they can just look at the images we take. So we take very close up images so that they can maybe gather enough data that we don't have to mail these very delicate specimens around the world. Um, so we're gonna look at bees, yeah? Ready? Yeah. So okay. I want to add that every time Christian introduces a bee, I'd like to give some information to uh, people out in Salt Lake about what, when you would expect to see these bees and what kind of habitat and other sorts of needs they would have in case you want to look for them in your own yards at, uh, you know, in, in your own properties. And then also in case you'd like to be able to enhance that kind of habitat for your own properties. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. So we're gonna start with, so let me explain what you're looking at here. This is a very close up image of a bee called an anthidium. It's a wool carter bee. And in this image, you can see the original data label. So without a data label, a museum specimen doesn't have value. So we see that it was collected in Salt Lake City on the 14th of July in 1946 by Don Reese. He was a prominent entomologist. And then it was identified by Sky Burrows in 2019 um, as an anthidium. So it took that many years before an expert came through and looked at it and identified it. And then um, in the last couple of years, we've assigned it a catalog number so that it could be databased. So that kind of is the um, administrative history of this little tiny bee. Down in the lower left-hand corner, you see a size mar uh, a scale bar that tells us what two millimeters looks like, kind of gives you a size, uh, an, an, indication of how big that specimen is. When a researcher is looking at a bee um, or any insect specimen, they might be looking at the wing venation or they might be looking at um, the segments or the tarsal uh, num number of segments, that's their little feet. Um, I'm trying to be scientific, but I also think they're really cute. So um, this and is- They look at mandibles in, too. And the mandibles, that's right. And the hairs and the shape mm -hmm. of the eyes and the antennal segments. So. Um, that's, so photos from all angles are really valuable. Yeah, let's see if the next one is, I think the next one is also this. Same bee, side view. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What do you want to say about this one, Amanda? Okay, so, so you mentioned these are wool carter bees. So one of the things that they do, the females scrape leaf hairs and, and stem hairs, the, uh, the trichomes off of leaves and stems so that they can like, get fluff to line their nests. Um, you're going to see these guys fly in late April to August, but like you said, this was collected, I believe, in May. Um, oh, July. July, okay, so within that time frame. Um, they're solitary nesters. They usually look for pre-existing tunnels in wood or thick stems. Um, they tend to prefer plants that are in the, the pea family, uh, Fabaceae, or in Asteraceae, the sunflower family, or in the water leaf family, the hydrophyllum. Um, and you're going to find them in drier habitats and deserts. So that's that's the kind of area that, that you should uh, look for and protect your bees. You know where I see these guys? So what I'll, um, what's the fuzziest plant you can think of in people's yards? Um, lambs. Lambs here. 
Lamb zero, oh, yeah, for sure. Yeah, right? <laughs> They're all over my lamb's ear all the time. Cute. Just, yeah, yeah. So fun. Okay. Ears. Okay, so moving on. This is an image we borrowed from um, the Colorado Plateau Museum because I couldn't resist. This is an anthophora and it's a digger bee. So um, what do you want to say about digger bees, Amanda? <laughs> well, they dig. They dig. Uh, you can so these bees tend to have really striking uh, hair patterns. They can have like bright colors, um, a lot of contrast. They're really pretty. Um, they fly from May to July. Uh, they're fairly generalist pollinators and that means they're really good for your crops or your, if you're gonna grow garden veggies or fruits. They, all that hair means that they can carry a lot of pollen. And so that is really good for them. And they also really, um, they're going to visit a lot of the native wildflowers that you'd see in the in the summer. You're going to see them on penstemon and lupine and evening primroses. And they're really cute because the way they nest, they, they're ground nesters in large communities. So they might share the same entrance, but then have like this vast network of tunnels where like hundreds of families live inside. They're really, really cute. They're really cute bees. I love them. I love them. I love the next bees you're going to show. Oh, I knew you would. I, oh, okay, so this is Amanda's favorite, but a lot of people's favorite. And I have three images of this. So um, this is Bombus, which are the bumblebees, which are actually trickier than you would think. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we may, maybe this is more Sony. Maybe Bombus more Sony. I'm not sure. Yeah, and this is what we call an anterior shot. It's a face on shot. And then Oh, look at that dorsal shot. So My goodness. <laughs> so cute. Okay, so yeah, they're tough to ID because they have variation across their range, right? For, so if you had the same species down in New Mexico, up in Wyoming, up in, in Idaho, in, in Nevada, the range, uh, there's a lot of variation in their patterns. So it's really hard to identify them specifically. Um, they are found all over North America. There's probably about 12 species or more of bumblebees in Utah. So you're, you're gonna find a bunch of them in your garden throughout the summer. Um, they are early spring flowers. As you can see, they're heavily uh, insulated and they're pretty big. So they are very fluffy. They can fly in cooler climate. Like, so they can come out pr pr pretty much early in the spring. That means they tend to visit a lot of early, like, like fruit trees, like orchard trees. Um, they can, so you'll start seeing them at least in Utah around uh, March to April and all the way through uh, September even. Um, so they're, they're only going to have one colony per year, which means that, you know, their, their little colonies are, uh, they're going to have provisions for their social nesters in the ground, and they usually look for like uh, rodent burrows, so things that already have a lot of nesting material inside or keep them warm and dry but then they can also help like temperature regulate so they can kind of buzz to keep themselves in their nest warm. Um, but they're only provisioning their, their nest for a single year. So they don't collect a lot of nectar. They don't make, they don't make honey the way honeybees do. Um, they are pretty generalist. You're gonna find them all over various different kinds of flowers. They love wildflowers, they love fruit trees, they love uh, all kinds of asters, coneflower, rudbeckia, sunflowers. You're going to find them a lot in meadow habitats, um, especially in undisturbed soil. So that's like a critical feature of habitat for them. Um, and uh, they can fly kind of in the dark too. They're, I mean, they have they can handle pretty low low light, not in the dark, but like darker mornings, you know, earlier. Um, and uh, they have pretty long tongues, so that means that they can forage on a variety of different. Um, plant species. But I have a thousand other things I could tell you about bumblebees, but we don't have that long. So, you know, <laughs> there's, awesome. there's, there's stuff out there to, to look up, but you know, just, just know that, that bumblebees are amazing. They are, they are. Okay. So this is a cute little weird one called Coletis, <laughs> and it's known as the cellophane bee. It's such a weird one. Um, do I have two pictures? No. Okay, so this one was collected in just Utah County in 1910. It looks like June 5th, 1910. I don't have a collector's name, but I have a guess who it was. 
And um, what do you want to say about cellophane bees? Okay, so they're all over the north. All, they're all over North America. Um, this particular group. Sometimes they're also known as as polyester bees. They fly um, between May and August, typically, and um, you'll you'll find them in. They nest in in their ground nesting, and they like they're pretty particular about their the 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 soil types that they're looking for. They often look for sand dunes and loamy turf, so they need a lot of drainage in in that kind of soil. Um, a lot of them are specialists to particular plant families, so like some of them specialize to the entire pea family or to the entire aster family. Um, and yeah, they uh, they make uh, material with their with their saliva, I believe, that helps seal in their nests. And it's cool, it just like- and it looks like plastic. It does look like cellophane, yeah. Yeah, uh -huh. they're weirdos, and they're little. And yeah. they're little. <laughs> and look, it took this one 109 years to get identified. <sighs> yeah. Yeah, that's how museum work is sometimes. Okay, moving on. This is a little Nomia. M and no, is this the This is megachylid. Yeah. Oh, yep. You love them. The leaf chewing bees. Look how fluffy. Look at the little head. head. Uh huh. What giant eyes this one has. And then if you look on top, you can see three tiny other eyes. Yep. So those them. eyes are called ocelli, and they're simple, and they help uh, a bee recognize like light levels so they can, you know, it just it helps a lot of insects. I mean, you, you see that kind of structure on most insects heads and it helps them rec recognize like what time of day it is it's basically their their watch mm -hmm. here's another of the same this is the same um bee from the side and you can see it's rather visual can you imagine if your eyes were that size of your head it's kind of astounding um and this is uh it's a leaf chewer bee right leaf cutters leaf cutters yeah <laughs> Leaf cutter, leaf yeah, chew they, chew, they chew leaves, sure, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so these guys are found, they're found uh, from May through September, typically. Uh, there's a bunch of different species of leaf cutter bees. Um, and they're the ones that you see, well, you can see the evidence of them. That there's like little circles cut out of your rose leaves. And what are they, I mean, they're really harmless to your plants. So they're not pests, but they like bougainvillea and other, you know, things where they can get this nice, um, non-toxic, um, uh, leaf or, or petals that they use to then line the insides of their nests. Um, they're solitary nesters um, and they usually use twigs or other small cavities in wood to, um, to you know, create these individual cells for their, for their offspring. Um, so this, you know, you might see these little pink like casings or whatever. Um, so you might find them between rocks, you might find them under cow pies, you might find them under dead plant material, like bark on the ground. Um, so they like undisturbed areas, right? That's, that's what they're relying on is something that's gonna stick it out through the winter so that they can, um, so that they can you know, ensure safety for their offspring. And these species range from specialists to generalists, and you're gonna find them on milkweed species on alfalfa and other pea flowers on thistles which are really great pollen and nectar sources um, and a lot of these a lot of megachylids are actually found on species of flowers that bloom after fire so that's an interesting um, uh, e ecological interaction that they have and um, one of the one of the species that's heavily managed is the alfalfa leafcutter bee which pollinates alfalfa crops one of my favorite things about these bees before we move on is if you can see their really fluffy little, um, the base of their abdomen is especially fluffy with hairs. That's where they collect all of their pollen. They, they uh, tend to lift their abdomen up when it's heavy with pollen and it's got this like Cheeto dust of thick yellow underneath when, when, they, when they're all laden and then they carry all that back to their nest to provision for their offspring. So it's just like, yeah, look how cute they are. <laughs> With their dirty tummies. <laughs> it's like all that Cheeto dust. <laughs> okay, now we're to Nomia. Okay. Uh, Helictids, they're sweat bees. Right? Yeah, they are. Mm -hmm. They're yep. called that because they're attracted to sweat. But oh my goodness, look at the antenna on that one. 
Oh, such a beauty. Do we have a lateral view? Nope. We just have that dorsal view. Mm. What a lovely, do you, what do you want to say about that? Okay. So helicta bees are pretty, pretty large category of bees. Um, they are found across West. These are especially summer flyers. So you'll find them in June through August. Um, they ground, they nest in the ground and they tend to look for like a, a soil that is uh, kind of hard on the surface. There's like a nice crust, but it's pliable underneath. Um, they tend to nest in larger aggregations and they can be pretty generalist um, because they get a lot of pollen. Um, so they have kind of a loose social structure occasionally. Uh, there might be sort of some communal behavior there. Um, and they like asters, they like all kinds of wildflowers that are annuals, they're good for berry, berry plants, um, they like shrubs, you might find them on your citrus, um, and any other fruit trees that you have. So these guys are pretty, um, they're pretty special. Mm -hmm. mm, very handsome bee. They are. Mm -hmm. um, this is the panu... Panugenus. Panugenus. I don't know why I have such a hard time saying that one. <laughs> It's a weird one. This one was collected in 1953 in Logan Canyon and identified by a prominent uh, entomologist, Dr. Bohart, a wonderful man. And interestingly, look at this lateral view. Look at that. Oh, that's the dorsal view. Look at that. It's like a Lamborghini. It is. It's built for speed. It's built for sneaking into tiny <laughs> Yep. So different than the other ones. And look how tiny with the one millimeter bar at the base. Yeah. Okay, so these are uh, confluent minor bees. Mm -hmm. So yeah, they, they're in that category of uh, andrenids known as mining bees, right? So Panogenus is um, a fairly generalist forager. Um, they, uh, they create, uh, they're, they ha they're pretty gregarious nesters. And they create this really cool wa like waterproof wallpaper somehow that scientists have not been able to figure out how to di dissolve or break down or melt or anything. They don't know what it is. They don't understand what, it's, what it comes from. You usually find them nesting in sunny areas. So like the nest entrance is going to be in, in, a, in an area that gets an ab abundant amount of sunlight in where there's sparse vegetation and the, the entrance to the nest might be somewhere like right next to or right underneath a rock or at the base of some like clump of vegetation um, that gives them some safety. Um, they're pretty cold hardy and sometimes you find them in the early, oh wait, when do they fly? April to July is about the time you'd expect to see them. And they, when it's chilly, they will, they will bask on rocks to warm up. <laughs> I know. I love it. So, <laughs> And that's all, I mean, they, they like fruit flowers. They, they'll, they're good pollinators for blueberries and cranberries. Uh, you find them on apple, apple flowers. Um, allium, the, all the onion plants that you might have. Um, they like cone flowers and rudbeckia, black-eyed Susan, sunflowers, all kinds of flowers. Oh, and then there's other species that really like maples and um, willows and mesquites and mallows. And so they might specialize on those. Some, some species of mining bees do that. That, that's just such a beauty. Since we're looking at this really good image, I wanted to point out that as you're looking at the wing here, a mm -hmm. lot of what's diagnostic for different species is the veins in the wings and the cells in between the veins. So each of those veins has a name and each of the cells in between has a name. So learning the names of the veins and the cells in between and the patterns of them, that's it's not random and it's uh, it's you know, genetic and uh, learning the language of wing veins is, uh, is a way to tell the difference of different species. So they're, they're very lovely and it's a fun way to, to learn different bugs. Okay, moving on. Oh, I love this name. It sounds so Russian. Sevastra, which are it's the- Sanskrit for sister. <laughs> is it really? Oh my gosh, I love it even oh. more now. So these are one of the longhorn bees, although these, the specimen seems to have lost its longhorns. And uh, <laughs> this one was identified- No horn bees. <laughs> the no horned, yeah, museum specimens, unfortunately. But this one was identified by, um, so I'm, I kind of concentrate on the labels because I'm a collection manager. And this one was collected on August 24th, no year, very interesting, on clover blossom. 
in Salt Lake, and it was identified by Missioner, who is one of the most important entomologists that has lived in the U.S. He was definitely a bee specialist, so it's a pretty special specimen. We have to find out when Missioner was in Utah, when mm -hmm. he might have identified that specimen, but it's exciting to have. It's like a famous specimen for me, you know, to see. It was touched by Missioner. So that's that's the collection Murdered. management aspect. Yeah. Okay. So what do you want to say about Sevastra, the sister bee? The the longhorn bees are are often considered sunflower bees because that's where you're gonna find them. That's what they like to visit. Um, and that's what you will often find them resting on sunflowers. Oof. Um they have they're large bees and they have these ridiculous <laughs> saddlebags like uh, leg hairs that <laughs> allow them to collect a lot of pollen. Um, you're gonna find them flying between June and October. So August would be right within that, cat, that uh, time frame. And they're ground nesters. They can be solitary to slightly communal with like a small, like maybe you know, up to a dozen or so kind of in the same nesting area. Um, some other species tend to specialize on sunflowers or on evening primrose or on cactus. And uh, for, for sunflower crops, these are actually really valuable bees for, for that. They help, they help sunflower, they help you know, us with sunflower seeds and sunflower oil. We rely on these guys for our food. Oh man, that is just, so what a gorgeous bee. Mm, it's a beautiful bee. Love it. Love little it. fluffy baby. <laughs> Okay, we're, we're coming to our last one. Ready? Yeah. Okay. But this is by no means all the bees in Utah. This is, yeah, we just, a, this is a select sampling. One one thousandth, and I'm not exaggerating, of the yeah. bee diversity. We're just want to open your eyes to some of the glorious tiny creatures around you. Um, okay, so this is Triepiolus. Tri you are so good at this. You just like, they trip right off That's your tongue. language. <laughs> this was collected um, by one of my favorite entomologists. He was a postal worker on the west side of the valley, and he collected for 40 years as a side hobby, Ezra Day. And he kept meticulous notebooks. And when he passed away about a decade later, his family donated all of his specimens to the museum. And they have been unique and phenomenal. They have just been an incredible asset to the museum. And every year, about every other year, his family comes up and visits his collection. Yeah, so this is a, so like museum collections are part geography and history and biography and it's, it's wonderful. Culture. So this is Ezra's B um, from Hunter, Utah, which is a town that isn't even called Hunter anymore from West Valley. Um, and it looks like it was from the, Markings, I think it's 1962. I don't think it's 1912, just knowing Ezra. It looks like 62. Yeah, yeah. So from Hunter. Okay, what do you want to say about these? these uh, they're cuckoo, cuckoo bees. Ah, they're, cuckoo they're kleptoparasites. Mm. So they have, uh, so this bee would have likely followed another bee, you know, one of its host species. They have like hand, like several categories of, of species that they, they uh, parasitize. And they follow that bee back to her nest where she's provisioning and they and this bee would lay her egg on just a, like a, 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 a pollen loaf that that, bee, that that bee the host bee is is preparing and then basically this bee's offspring would grow on so they don't you don't know what they pollinate you don't know what they collect because they're just they're really just laying their eggs on other people's hard or other bees hard work <laughs> they're mooches they're, coo they're cuckoos um, so, you know, they'll be active around, the, they're active when their hosts are active. So there's no real like d defined way. And there's no great uh, data that, that, that describe where, what flowers you would find these guys on. Um, but you can help support this species by providing habitat for its host species. Um, and they're cool because they have like really striking patterns and they usually have like black and white bodies or black and like pale yellow. And they often have red legs and they're really pretty. They're really pretty little bees. You know what I'm noticing is this doesn't have very much hair compared to the other. Yeah, ones. It's probably not a great because pollen. because it doesn't carry pollen. It's not carrying pollen back to its nest. It's just it's just mooching. Mm -hmm. She doesn't yeah. cook. She doesn't clean. <laughs> <laughs> okay, yeah. so I wanted to close this. I wanted to like not close necessarily, but I wanted to get into what I think is so important about having this kind of collection and just the fact that Utah is 
is this home to such bee diversity? You know, if we have over a thousand de described species of bees in all the beautiful, unique places, Utah is so diverse and so unique. And so the fact that we have all these incredible bees everywhere is like our, like we're, we're number one, that's our claim to fame. It brings a lot of researchers here. It brings a lot of, um, you know, there, there, there are a lot of like interesting specialists on bees that come and work in Utah. So that's really, um, we are on the map for that reason. Um, and, you know, in Salt Lake, you're, you're gonna, you know, our growing season is from about May to about October. And when, if you wanna help protect, the, you know, this diversity that would be in Northern Utah and in Salt Lake Valley, um, you can create habitat or you can enhance existing habitat in your yards because private property really accounts for most of the land out here or a, a significant portion of it. And that represents a lot of habitat that could potentially be available for these bees. So the things that I always encourage are having nesting habitat and having foraging habitat. These are the things that bees need. These are the things that all insects need. Um, but they, uh, they, they're gonna rely on diverse flowering species that bloom from spring to late summer. So try and find as many native species as you can that are blooming perpetually or you know, providing uh, pollen and nectar all season long, because that's, you're gonna be attracting. I mean, if you have that habitat, they will find it, they will come. And if you can limit putting pesticides in your yard, please do so as much as possible. Definitely don't spray on flowers. And if you can, and if you really absolutely need to spray something, apply those those pesticides at night when they're not flying because that helps prevent. And you know the systemic pesticides are are going to make it into pollen and a nectar, and you'd be poisoning bees if you if you have treated plants with systemic pesticides like neonicotinoids. So if you're using that stuff, you can't you, you know you can't prevent the the toxicity that bees will be experiencing. So just so you know. Little sidebar, if you left your dandelions alone, they're really valuable for all kinds of pollinator communities. I know people hate them, but you know what? They are, they're necessary. They're really valuable to pollinator communities. If you have the ability to leave some bare, undisturbed ground in your yard, like, or maybe just like a garden path that's, that's dirt that's kind of tamped down, um, that kind of, that kind of land, that kind of ground is really valuable for, for certain ground nesting bees. Um, if you have, uh, if you want to provide like nesting material for, um, for like wood nesting or cavity nesting bees, uh, you can get a commercially available bee box. I, I know people who've gotten some of theirs at, you know, at, at garden supplies or at Costco or various other things. Um, you can allow your perennial, uh, plants to, um, like after they're done flowering and you just kind of cut down. So you leave. Uh, uh, at least two, you know, at least 24 inches or, you know, depending on how old, you, how tall the plant got, leave some stem uh, behind. Uh, those, those stems are really valuable uh, for twig nesting bees. If you have logs or stumps or woody debris or anything like that, that, that you can leave behind, carpenter bees and things like that are going to love that area. And also as an, uh, uh, in, uh, as an extension of that, if you, um, if you check your firewood before you throw it into a fire, I, I've, I've had that experience once before where a bunch of a bunch of carpenter bees ended up being, you know, pouring out of out of a log that we'd thrown thrown on a fire in November. And it, I mean, I tried to rescue some of them, but it was one it was the worst one of the worst nights of my life watching these bees coming out of a of a burning log. It was horrifying. Um, you know, also if you left like uh, untreated lumber or you know if you have specific things that you're just designating as bee habitat then those are things that you can do if you created your own bee block um, and then maybe rolled up so you can drill holes into a, a chunk of untreated lumber um, they could be between like a quarter inch to a half inch in dyna diameter and between one and a half to three inches deep and keep them about an inch apart from each other and if you want it to be especially uh, beneficial for nesting, having a smooth inside is really good. So if they have like a rolled up piece of paper or wax paper or something like that inside there, that also helps. So those are the things that I would recommend if you wanted to have habitat in your yard is to help support our native bees. Um, 
and and then you can see them and you can then you can go out and observe your yard and 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 bask in the uh in the snow white beauty of bringing all these things bringing all the bees to your yard <laughs> I have a question. Um, Please. I have a bunch of dogs that roam around my yard all the time. Um, and um, I'm just, I'm just imagining that they destroy all the potential habitat when they kind of, they fight and like you throw the ball around. And is there any way to kind of work around that? Or um, are, is, does that explain why <laughs> our crop this year has not been as high as I would have expected? Do the bees dig holes? I mean, do the dogs dig holes? A little, certain areas, yeah. Mm. So. If you, if you could fence off an area where they couldn't dig or just keep them yeah. away from an area. But it's really just the digging because as Amanda repeated over and over, many of them are nesting in the ground, you know. Yeah. But just undisturbed is like, that's the, that's what they require is just something that's going to be peaceful be good for that dogs and bees can coexist very yeah. happily together yeah okay. and solitary bees they're not stinging bees i mean if you right. messed with it you know it might sting but like you'd literally have to you know get into a knife fight or something in order to you know <laughs> solitary bees don't <laughs> most native bees don't sting even bumblebees like i've handled plenty of bumblebees in my research and you know I've never gotten stung by a bumblebee. Wow. So you really have to, they're, they're extremely docile, you know? So stinging is, is never going to be the issue, you know? Mm -hmm. um, I have a question, question for you, Christy, um, since um, you know so much about the specimen and the, the science behind bees. And one question I've had for a while is um, for honeybees, mm -hmm. how, how come they're so good at geometry? How is that explained in science? Why they're so good at the hexagonal uh, shapes? Does that have a rhyme or reason to it? Well, I think the truth is that all of these bees are really good at different things. You yeah. know, good at digging the right depth of hole and angling it to the sun the right way and finding the right materials to overwinter their babies and provisioning them appropriately to the millimeter for frost control. You know, they all are. And um, it's not because it, they're smart, it's because of evolution. It's because the ones that aren't good at whatever didn't make it. So, yeah. You know, right. Yeah. I would say that there's also a degree of like bubble math in, in all of that where, you know, it's, it's, it's the most efficient way to stack a bunch of cylinders together. They all end up kind of compressing into hexagons, mm -hmm. you know, so like the outermost, I don't think that the outermost cells in a beehive are actually perfectly hexagonal yet. Like they have to be kind of packed in, but you know, I'm not a beekeeper, so I don't, I don't want to um, be quoted on any of that, but it's definitely bubble math. <laughs> you know there's there's some three-dimensional geometry there that's that plays a role the yeah. bees that made square hives they're not around anymore <laughs> right Pentagonal. yeah they just didn't shapes. Make it. yeah they just didn't make it. <laughs> i wanted to say one thing before we close too about we're going to scroll through these bees about the way other ways that people can be involved besides building habitat and that's Great. that there's uh there's a couple there's a lot of resources there's the Utah State Extension Office. Um, there's um, a lot of different kinds of resources around, but uh, a resource to learn more about the bugs around you is Bug Guide. It's an online field guide. It's fantastic. Um, there's Facebook groups like Insect Identification, where people can get IDs really, really quick if they um, wanna know what something is, and a really great way to participate in uh, learning more, but also documenting all the living things around you is iNaturalist. So um, it's an app, but if you don't like smartphones, you can also just take pictures and upload them on a desktop. iNaturalist is uh, used by researchers. We really, really love it. So uh, you're on a walk, you see a plant you're unfamiliar with, or you see something that you're interested in learning more about, or that you already know and you just want to document. And so you can or you just want to show off how, how good your photography skills are. Yeah, so. Yeah. so you can create a library of your observations. I think it's a nice way when I travel for me to create a library of remembering the plants and 
everything, bugs that I saw when I was someplace. You create a library of your own observations and then you ID it to the best of your ability. Maybe you just know something's a snake and eventually somebody will come along and ID it further for you. And it helps research create, researchers create uh, range maps of where things are. So I get an identification about plants. I get um, a history of things I've seen because I often forget the names of wildflowers that bloomed last year for this year. Um, but it also helps researchers know, oh, that is a new species. And they might contact you and say, I'm surprised to find that in your neighborhood. Can you keep an eye out for more of those? Um, so it's a great way to participate in research and also just learn more about the world around you. And for bees, it, it really helps with phenology. You know, it helps us to understand when things are being seen when the flooring, flowering resources that they're found on are, are also present so that we can keep track of that. And then, you know, on my end with the, with rare species, you know, it's really, really valuable because if I'm looking for insects, it's a lot harder to find them if I don't know what plants to look for. Mm -hmm. That's really helpful for me. Yeah. So, so that's, we're very excited about bees. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you two so much. Uh, yeah. This was so fascinating to see all the different bee species so close up and how amazing it is that these are from over a hundred years ago and that it, it takes just that long, almost a hundred years or more to identify these species. It's very new to me. So, uh, yeah. Well, um, Let's wrap this up. Um, well, uh, oh, can you uh, stop sharing your screen there, Christy, and then yeah. I'll share mine. Um, yeah. Um, thanks again, Christy and Amanda. You two were so helpful in um, really digging deeper into the world of bees in the museum, bees in the backyard, and um, I just, I, I feel like I know so much more. So thanks again. Can I plug, can I plug one more thing? Absolutely. I got a lot of this information. Well, I mean, I, you know, it really is nice to have a resource that I can go to if I really want to find out some information. And one of our, one of our bee specialists is in Utah and he and, and a colleague published this incredible book. I don't know if it's backwards. It looks backwards on my screen. Bees in your backyard. This is such a wonderful book and it's, it's uh, Joe Wilson, who's at University of, uh, sorry, Utah State University, Tooele, and his colleague, Olivia Messenger Carroll. And they, this is, it's phenomenal. It's such a helpful resource. And if you want to know more about the bees in your backyard, it's an affordable book and it's got beautiful photos. It's so good. Anyway, that's my plug. Thank you for that. Yes, that sounds like such a good resource. I've, yeah. It's wonderful. <laughs> Well, thank you two again, and um, thanks for having pleasure. us. It's a yeah, pleasure. yeah. Happy Bee Fest. Happy, yeah, bee, happy bee Fest. fest. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Take thanks, care. Sophie. Thank Bye. you. Bye.